This week's conversation with Anna McDowell of Henry's Buttons is sponsored by Sassy Jack Stitchery. Kim and the folks at Sassy Jack's are getting ready to open their new forever home in January, and it'll be exciting to be able to visit the new store. In the meantime, be sure to check out sassyjackstitchery.com for the full collection of Sassafras Samplers charts. Kim and company are also now carrying the beautiful cottage garden threads and new designs from Ink Circles, including the Victorian License Cosmo Kit. When you're doing your holiday shopping, a great gift for your stitching friends is a Sassy Jacks gift certificate. Sassy Jacks is also a great place to get supplies so you can make dorset buttons. Make Sassy Jacks Stitchery your local needlework store by visiting the website at sassyjackstitchery.com and plan to visit when the new shop opens in January. And now, let's learn about dorset buttons with our guest, Anna McDowell. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, oh, this is going to be fun. Anna McDowell from Henry's Buttons, Dorset Buttons. Anna, welcome. Hello. Oh, boy. Dorset Buttons. This this was so much fun to research. The, the, the cool thing is there's so much history and then there's the art of the buttons. So I, I got all bogged down in the history. It was pretty neat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I must admit, from the list of questions you sent to me, yes, I can quite understand. But, you know, you did get a lot of information about them. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it was so much fun. So, okay, so 2022 is the 400th anniversary for Dorset Buttons. I guess I guess we should start by telling people what Dorset Buttons are because – I'm sure people just simply don't know. So give us a, you know, give us your elevator pitch on what a dorset button is. Right. A dorset button uh, is a very small, very discreet little button that would have been on virtually everybody's clothing. It's rather like a shirt button is today or a blouse button is today, or should I say a zip or a um, Velcro on your clothing. It instead of having any of those modern inventions, you very well would have had a dorset button. And when we get to the history of 400 years, so that yeah, it takes us back a minute. So when it back when dorset buttons were were used uh, for everyday use, that was the closure device. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. There's a there's a lovely little bit of um, in a book by Ian Kelly on Beau Brummel, the man of fashion. And he describes how his master put on his shirts done up with tiny little dorset buttons. <laughs> and so we're talking about uh, the end of the 17th, beginning of the 1800s. Okay, well, I just can't, I can't imagine. So there was a whole industry then of people making buttons. Absolutely. Uh, at one point, they said that uh, over 12,000 people in Dorset would have made Dorset buttons. <laughs> Holy smokes. <laughs> yep, yep. Mm -hmm. It was a very profitable business, cottage industry. But what I like about the whole industry itself, I'm sorry to sort of go back again, but... Uh, oh, no, no, tell the stories, I, because... No, I, I, I love the fact that the button industry was actually invented by someone called Abraham Case. Now, Abraham wasn't from the area of Dorset. He was from an area, uh, the Cotswolds, sort of Gloucester, around that area, the Cotswolds area. And um, apparently he was a professional soldier, and as there wasn't any kind of, shall we say, um, out, outlet for his uh, chosen career in England, or, um, he went to Europe. On his way back from Europe, he ended up in a, a village very close to Shaftesbury called Dorset. Uh, it's called Donhead St. Andrew. And uh, or the other story is that he ended up in the next door village called Warder. Anyway, whichever village he ended up with, he actually fell in love and married a local girl. So I actually go around saying that the Dorset, um, Dorset button industry actually, uh, was founded as a love story. 
when a man fell in love with a woman and settled in her area. <laughs> so, so this name, Dorset Button, is nothing more than this is where this guy ended up and and started this whole thing. So it because you, you hear Dorset Button and you think, well, that's a technique or a style, but it, it's it's nothing more than that's where he lived. That's where he lived in Dorset. He ended up in Shaftesbury in Dorset. And the whole thing starts there. So, oh, I, I can just imagine if that many people are making buttons everywhere you go, so, somebody's stitching a button. <laughs> just... Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, the, um, the the county was divided into areas where which would have had um, depots. And uh, the villagers either took their buttons to a depot or agents used to go out and collect buttons. Mm. But what's at each of these depots, and again, history sort of doesn't actually uh, show us exactly how many, but uh, so far I've counted references to about, I think it's 12 of these depots around the country, this our county, and it's uh, the depots, the buttons would have been collected and then washed and then graded and then carded onto uh, a colour uh, card depicting what grade they were put at. So they were graded according to what? I think quality. Okay, so not so. And then what about like size or anything like that? Oh yes, there, there were size as well. I suppose really what you would have done is the size um, and the quality, and then they were graded in wonderful sort of uh, uh, diagonal or. Um, uh, patterns or square patterns onto long lengths of card. And then who sold, then, then, then what happened to those cards? Were they sold to like tailors or they sold in London? I mean, I then haven't what actually been able to discover exactly how the, um, what the, should we say, distribution side of the box were. But yes, they would have been sold to tailors, to anybody who was in that trade when wanted buttons so okay because you know i think today all right today we we buttons and and you can go to a store and just get the the standard four hole or two hole white and black and blue yeah. and whatever <laughs> would, would we have yeah. had people who are, who are learning the skills making just plain dorset buttons uh absolutely how, how yeah, did that play out cool. Mm -hmm. they, they were sort of, it was a family concern, really. I suppose what ha happened was you had uh, mainly women, as far as I can uh, work out from references, to, um, historical references, making the buttons themselves. And they could have been mothers, her, uh, daughters, uh, they could have been wives, anybody uh, were making buttons. But in the depots, you had small boys dipping wire into a solder to actually solder them together. They were they actually had a technical term called dippers. So you can imagine how that must have been um, sort of uh, detrimental to their health. Should yeah, I say. yeah, I'm sure that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah you can count on that. <laughs> One thing you have to realize in Dorset, the agricultural workers, which is probably where the um, work the force came from that worked on the Dorset button, um, were the poorest paid in the country. And so any supplements to the family income would have been very, very useful. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is so neat is the barrier to entry is so low. I mean, it's, you know, just give me some thread and... and uh, circle devices and I can start making buttons. Um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. wow. But are they of, are they of the right quality and the right size? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh. So what did they use for their base when they start, when they first made the buttons? Well, there are four different designs of Dorset buttons. There are the high tops and the Dorset gnomes. Oh, sorry, dorset knobs, and the high tops were a cylindrical, uh, sorry, a pyramid-type shape, 
and um, the the Dorset uh, knobs were sort of domed shaped and they were made from a form of fabric dipped in flour water paste formed into a hard um, mold and at the base of that mold there would have been a tiny piece of sheep's horn to uh, make it strong and when the um, button was sort of molded into the right shape and dried it was then embroidered over and uh, I've seen very similar buttons um, of high quality it worked on a um, wooden frame a wooden um, pyramid shape tiny little pyramid shape and uh, embroidered with gold thread so it basically it's a linen thread version of a high quality button and then they had uh, a bird's eye button which is just a cylindrical donut shape and then uh, made out of fabric and then embroidered over again um, then we come to the ring buttons. Now, originally, they probably would have used bone rings. Now, um, but the, the wire rings were introduced in the 1730s by, a by Abraham Case's grandson called Peter Case. Now, he, um, the wire rings were actually the start of the buttons that we know today. And they could actually get constant continuity in, uh, um, in diameter, in size. And I must admit, they do make wonderful, wonderful bases for a thread button. <laughs> yeah, because if you're using ram's uh, uh, ram's horn, yeah, you get, getting the same size every time, just about impossible. Absolutely. Or, I've actually got a collection of bone horn, well, ho bone um, uh, rings, and I must admit, uh, every single one is slightly different. <laughs> But it does get back to that uh, that practice of using every every aspect of an animal. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But little do you think that uh, buttons come uh, comes from it. <laughs> right. So I'm picturing then uh, people who make just everyday buttons, and then there has to be this elite group of people who are doing the custom buttons and the high end things for royalty, and uh, there must have been a real uh, stratus uh, pyramid of of skill and and uh, who makes the the better buttons for the most money and that kind of thing it must have been quite interesting i think the whole industry of button making is very interesting because here in england at one point in the early 1700s there was a tax on anybody wearing over a certain number of buttons and you had to pay well you had to pay a tax on the excess numbers <laughs> <laughs> So if you had a whole bunch of buttons going down your dress, you oh. had to pay a tax on that. If you had over a certain number, yes. Oh, interesting. But just... it was drawing a certain wall, which I think may have been we, we, the one we had with um, Canada or maybe even your country. <laughs> <laughs> we, had to, we had to pay for it somehow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> It's it's so interesting because I follow this uh, this history lady I forget her name on Instagram, who does most of her little clips in in England, and she showed uh, buildings where there were windows that are bricked over, and she said at one time there was a tax on extra windows like you were allowed X number yep. of windows and so after that you had to pay a tax for the window, and so then people just bricked them up so they didn't have to pay. And yep. so, okay, so I'm bricking up windows and I'm cutting down on the number of buttons so I don't have to pay tax. <laughs> <laughs> no one likes to pay taxes. No. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and that was the point she made was that uh, it didn't matter what your economic status was. People bricked over their windows because they weren't paying and it backfired on them because they mm -hmm. thought that they would collect uh, be able to collect money from the richer people who had more more uh, windows, and and they didn't. The, the rich people bricked them up just like everybody else. So. Absolutely. Oops. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, take that. Yeah. So so the metal rings. Now you talk about uh, health. Yeah, I'll bet making metal rings in that time that was had nothing to do with people's health. Uh, oh, absolutely. 
nothing. No, no, it would have been horrendous. But don't forget, the people who are actually making the buttons uh, themselves would have actually come from the agricultural workers uh, who were paid probably um, when, when they were needed. So if they weren't needed, they wouldn't have got any income. And um, so you can imagine that, uh, especially in Dorset, where they were the lowest paid in the country, um, button making was a constant in for source of income. Right, right. And all sorts of people. You could, with those, uh, unfortunately, being uh, a, um, uh, a, 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 should we say, audio as opposed to a visual um, chat. I can't show you a lovely picture I have of the of a post inside of a cottage that one of these buttoners would have actually been um, lived in. But uh, I must admit, the facilities would have been awful. Yeah. Well, se send the photo and we'll include it uh, with the postings. Um, Unfortunately, I'm not able because it's copyrighted. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I'm allowed to show you, but I can't publish. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well send me the photo and i'll show it on our wednesday night live show we can do that so i love it we'll get a we'll, we'll, try. Yeah. we'll cheat the mm -hmm. system somehow so do you yeah. have any idea what the distribution was was it just within the uk or did it get over to european mainland in terms of how big of a source was for buttons was dorset well, they do say it was an international trade. Uh, whether it went to, I haven't, but I haven't got any evidence of this. But I'm just assuming that drawing, for argument's sake, um, the English over in the English army over in Canada and uh, and also the states, we would have actually had to send supplies. So I'm just wondering if supplies of replacement buttons on shirts, etc., would have been amongst it. Which would have been Dorset buttons, maybe. Yeah. But I have no evidence of that. Yeah, and 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 those sort of they're long gone. I mean, to find something like that would be would be extraordinarily difficult, is my guess. Absolutely. What it would be lovely to know if any of your museums um, hold anything that was English of that era and. If, it, if they have any sort of old shirts or something, do they have Dorset buttons on them? Yeah, yeah I, that just got, I just got a whole new interest level in old clothing now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and when I go to museums, I always go and I look at the clothing, If especially we went to, I don't know, some little small museum in a small town and they had somebody's clothing from the 1860s maybe 1830s and I was looking you know how was the dress put together it, just because I found it fascinating but I didn't think to look for dorset buttons on it oh. well unless you know about dorset buttons there's no reason why you should but um um because I, I have a, a, as you may uh, sort of realise, I do have an interest in Dorset buttons. And I've been around museums looking at original items of clothing. And I must admit, I've seen so many high status items, items of clothing that have got Dorset buttons on them. Yeah, yeah. and I just think to look and because um, I've known about Dorset buttons, but I didn't realise that they were that old you know that's what oh yes yes the verb the industry actually started going out of uh, well they were superseded by um mecha uh, mechanization i um thread buttons and fabric buttons made by machines way back in the oh gosh when they first started button uh started inventing machines i think the earliest one was 1807 then there was another one uh, developed by someone called Benjamin Saunders, who is, uh, rat and he painted it, his machine in 1825. So you could say, as from about that period, the Dorset button industry was really gradually put out of business. Yeah, oh, you, yeah, you can see if you can stamp them out of a machine. Um, yeah. yeah. But there still had to have been, I would think, some carryover in fashion because at some point you, know, you, you got to have the special button. Um, well, dorset buttons weren't regarded as that special. 
what you did have is a lot of um, people develop the crochet button and um, the the what I call the knot buttons and things like that. A lot of um, Victorian items of clothing have those sort of buttons, which are not not really dorset buttons. Mm. <laughs> And they're much more elaborate than a dorset button. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, it says here in the research that uh, Dowager Lady Lees is yes. attributed with, with basically saving the dorset button, and then that, that takes it off into more of an art form. Yes. Um, she must have been a very lovely lady because um, she went round hov um, hamlets and farm farm farms and you know farm cottages just talking to people who remember their mothers or their um or they themselves making dorset buttons you must remember that dorset button industry virtually went out by the 1850s lady lee started researching um basically um 50 years later and uh, it was due to her that we managed to save all the different styles of dorset buttons and what people do today is take the one particular design which is terribly popular nowadays which is called I call it the cartwheel design some people may call it the crosswheel but um, I take it as the cartwheel design because a, a person a, a, there's a historian who wrote a book about the village that Lady Lee's um, lived in and describes how these buttons were made and how they were distributed at the time. And she described the cartwheel button, which is exactly the same one as we know today with the spokes that are further apart. The crosswheel, the spokes were very close together. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and then they're just, they were just, didn't they so they wove them to kind of together um in it like a needle weaving or did they is it more like um it's rough it's, it's sort of a between a, a a needle weaving and a needle embroidery because to make a dorset button you blank a stitch around the edge of your ring this is this is the cartwheel button you blank a stitch around your the your ring then you make the spokes and then you effectively what you're doing is backstitching over each spoke. So it's a form of weaving and a form of embroidery. How did you and become a dorset button addict? Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, gosh, basically by accident. Um, I was, um, I volunteered at our local museum here in Shaftesbury. And uh, I was uh, asked to put together a heritage lottery fund to raise funds to completely redo the whole of the museum. And one of the things that you're constantly asked way up there is the first question is, why, how can you justify vast sums of money being poured into your museum? And so basically we, we actually put the whole, um, uh, application for funding around the fact that the Dorset Bundes button industry started in Shaftesbury and we have the most wonderful collection in our museum and luckily we got the funding but yeah. well, I did learn how to make them simply I bought a kit from what became a friend of mine and uh, try, as, tried how to make them from that kit and first attempts weren't too bad and then I, uh, in Shaftesbury, there was a wonderful lady called Joan Nichols, who unfortunately is no longer with us. But uh, she was a very, very fine Dorset button. And she, she actually taught me the tricks of the trade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's always that person, isn't there? That knows oh, that. yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, so did, were you, had you done needlework of any kind before this or... Did the museum work get you doing dorset buttons, and then next thing you know, you're a needle artist, basically? No, I uh, way back in school days, uh, I was always um, how shall I put it? Uh, needlework and um, textile art and uh, uh, art were all my subjects. Ah. And um, I was I went to after school 
after completing A-levels and things like that, I, um, I went to art school for a year. But uh, being young and uh, not getting what I wanted, you start throwing your hands up in the air saying, I can't cope with this sort of thing. You know, <laughs> you know what an 18 year old can do. And <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I was one of those. <laughs> but uh, I've always, I always had a, a keen interest in fabrics and um, all my life, even when I was working at other things. <laughs> and uh, it was lovely to have that opportunity to come back to it. Yeah, there, there it is again. Uh, exposure to textile arts and needlework as a child and then yeah, then it comes back and pays off later. Yep. Oh, it does. It does. Mm -hmm. Happens mm -hmm. so often. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. So, so take us through uh, the dorset buttons. I mean, you mentioned the, the high tops and the knobs and the bird's eyes and the cartwheels. Uh, if, if I want to do a dorset button, do, is it the cartwheel I start with? Uh, the, the, high, the high tops crack me up because I can't imagine wearing a shirt with all those little bumps in the front, <laughs> just <laughs> catching on everything. I had, make, I had to make, I think it was 30 of those, um, those buttons and they wanted them fifth no, 15 centimeters high for a shirt in a film. And I must admit it nearly cracked me up. I can tell you because uh, trying to get them solid enough in the right shape, et cetera, was quite a challenge. <laughs> 15 centimeters? Well, I never saw the results. I must have. 15 centimeters? That's like, what, six or seven inches? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, a millimeters. I tell you, sorry, oh, millimeters. Oh, sorry. millimeter. Oh, okay. My mistake, millimeters. Mm -hmm. But still, that's, uh, wow. That's a high button. Yeah, I'll mm -hmm. say. <laughs> yeah. All I, all I can say is I hope they, I hope they sort of uh, didn't embrace anyone too strongly. Otherwise, the whole lot would have flattened. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh, they would have got pissed. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But these, so, so if if I want to start out with these things, uh, I mean, you you obviously can can help people do that. I mean, it's what you do. Uh, do I start with a cartwheel? Um, what... I always suggest start with a cartwheel. Yes, uh -huh. mm -hmm. you can have such fun with a cartwheel because um, with the cartwheel button. Uh, once you know the basics, you can then go into um, a cartwheel pattern. So the cartwheel patterns like spirals, daisies. Um, you can do cartwheels and beading. In fact, um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, a beading workshop, um, online beading workshop for a lace museum in San, Fra uh, in San Francisco later, uh, later in the year. Uh, I think it's beginning of um, December. And we're going, we're going to have at least two different types of buttons on, on a project, which is such fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in, in your kits and when you teach, do, are, do we now just use plastic rings or? No, I, I, personally, I keep away from plastic. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit like that. I prefer metal. Um, I do like stainless steel. I, I, I do like the white coated um uh, metal rings, which are the lingerie rings, um, they they're lovely. Mm -hmm. hmm. And well, that's for my smaller buttons. But for larger buttons, I use um, wooden hula hoops, which uh, I have to. Unfortunately, I have to buy quite large quantities. So my studio is just full of wooden hula hoops. <laughs> So, okay, so on the large wooden ones, then do you still do the buttonhole around the uh, around the edge of the hula hoop? Yep, blanket stitching around the edge. And whatever I do, all my, all my buttons are made in the traditional way because I do insist they are, you know. They, I So I blanket stitch all the way around my hula hoops. And, um, and then I use, and it could be a piece of fabric I use or, or threads, yards, anything. Um, raffia, I've used raffia, and um, then I then I use the same methods of the overstitching, you know, uh, for the spokes, etc. But again, using all different fabrics and yarns. Are those bigger ones easier to do, 
are more difficult or they're equally difficult. It's just a different challenge. They're both just different challenges. The bigger ones are take longer, <laughs> right? Yeah. And more and more yarns and threads. But uh, no, it it they both. Um, I, I approach them both in the same way because you have to think what you're going to do first before sort of diving in, and um, trying to get color matching and everything like that is just you know. You, you start with a project and you have to think all the way through before even starting. Right. Do you keep a sketchbook of ideas then? I do, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I suppose it's not ideas, it's sort of projects I've completed. And I also put a little, with some of my larger uh, ringed projects, I also try and keep a little sample of the uh, yarns I've used for that particular project just to remind me what, what went into it and to, to sort of feel the textures. Yeah. Right, right. It's interesting you say you stick with the traditional techniques. So uh, even today, you're at the core of what you do is preserving the, the original way of doing these things. Oh, absolutely. I think that's terribly important because... Um, it is a heritage craft, and I don't want to deviate from the techniques of that particular heritage craft. And it's a way of, but also it's a way of preserving the techniques. Is is it on the uh, on that list that you have of the uh, endangered uh, crafts? Yes, uh, Dorset Buttons is um, on that list, but it's not a, an endangered uh, okay. craft. It is just um, it's the next one uh, next one down. Mm -hmm. oh, okay but yeah all right so but it's still in that realm of this must be preserved oh uh, absolutely yeah. absolutely yes i was interviewed for when they actually started compiling that they did uh, interview me and uh, I, I must admit it, it was very interesting to um hear that well, to see the results of that particular exercise small group of you people who are doing this Luckily, we're growing. We are a growing group. Hooray. <laughs> yeah, which is lovely. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled because uh, workshops, I do online workshops, and I'm thrilled the way the news is getting about, about these buttons. Yeah, I've seen, you know, other art that they, you learn the basic Dorset button, and then I think there's artists who are, are changing it, you know, making it more contemporary. Yeah. Um, but I think that also keeps it alive because they'll say, this is a Dorset button. And then so people will go back and look and say, well, what is a Dorset button? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I've, I think um, it's terribly important that when you do do your contemporary pieces and wall art more than anything, you keep to the traditional um, methods, those yes, techniques, simply because then people can see a large version of what would have been a tiny, tiny, tiny sort of tiny button yeah right. the your your wall art is is very striking i really enjoyed looking at that is is that something that is relatively new with the technique or back when they were making buttons did people also uh create bigger pieces to hang on walls as decorative items no i i it's unique to now I, okay. i've never seen anything that big but I don't think they would have had the time to tell all this truth. <laughs> they need to crank out <laughs> buttons. <laughs> now to crack out more buttons. Yes. <laughs> and and that and the materials, because, you know, we, we're used to, you know, you go to the local store and you can buy yarns, you know, um, or, you know, to your local dyer or whatever to buy the yarn. Um, it's for us. It's not that we're not shearing the sheep carding the wool <laughs> <laughs> gathering the flax beating making linen you know we're not making those things anymore we're not doing that so we have that time yeah 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 that's a good point beth yeah we throw thread around like it's nothing and back then it's valuable yes oh it was a valuable thing can you imagine so i um at one point um the income that the um, women received for their buttons, a certain amount had to go out again for payment of the next source of uh, supplies for the, you know, the next week. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
<laughs> Become business people in a hurry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So take us through what you do. You have kits, workshops. What what is, tell us about your business so that people can relate to it and and those who have an interest can can know how to get involved in, in making these buttons. Um right. I well kits and things. I have a presence on it on Etsy, which is just simply Dorset Buttons. And um uh, People can actually buy kits, and I also um, upload some of my smaller jewelry pieces like earrings, bracelets, um, necklaces, that sort of thing. Um, then um, from my own website, I run, you know, people can go there for uh, workshops and things like that that I run online mainly. Uh, occasionally I do face-to-face. I do a lot of um, talks and workshops for groups over here in England, um, mainly embroiderers, um, textile groups. Um, well, they actually do the workshops, but also I do talks for other uh, um, organisations who are interested in local history because right where I live, it's Dorset Buttons is a local his- historical sort of craft. Mm-hmm. And of historical interest. Um, but I love the creation bit uh, where I do my ball art, my um, where I do my more my creating. And I so far this over the winter months, I, uh, I'm exhibiting in a local gallery here uh, close to where I live. And also I'm taking part in a, an, a weekend exhibition. Um, again, close to where I live. So I do enjoy, um, well, I love doing my well, my creative bit. <laughs> <laughs> I also have a, a, per, per, a permanent presence in um, two galleries, one at a lovely location called Sculpture by the Lakes near Dorchester in Dorset, and um, in a gallery, an art gallery in um, uh, Shaftesbury itself called the Signet Gallery. So I, I put I put my work about a bit. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So so artist and evangelist then. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. So so help me out. Uh, what size do I start with? Do I start with uh, uh, like a coat button size, or what? Uh, how do I get started? What is the best thing? I'm sure that that uh, you don't want to go too big and you don't want to go too small. I always start people either on a 19 millimeter or 25 millimeter ring and uh, and a quite a what I would call um, a size um, eight, should we say crochet thread. And that is a nice size to start with. Mm -hmm. And that way it it doesn't take you as long as you would uh, to actually make as it would if you went finer with using a finer thread. Okay. Mm-hmm. And special tools that we need or just... Uh... All you need is a, 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 a firm ring. Well, I, as I mentioned, uh, I prefer metal or something like that ring. Um, and uh, the th- yarn, as I mentioned, and also a blunt-ended needle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I probably would have used either a size 18 or a size 22 tapestry. Okay. All right. So that's a healthy needle. All right. Good. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) It's a healthy needle. (laughs) But okay. So it it really is not in in terms of materials. It's not a, not really not an investment at all. Um, Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. And a lot of people um, who do have yarn, you know, a stash of yarns, you know, just do a little bit of experimenting with all those yarns and a dorset button. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that'd be a problem for Beth having a stash, but uh, yeah. um... <laughs> we won't go there. We won't go there. Um... <laughs> well, Anna, one of these days we're going to get a tour of Beth's base basement and um, we're going to yeah. see the, the magic stash. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I have a question about the singletons. So, yes. so is that just a ring covered with fabric? 
It's a ring covered with fabric, which has been slightly padded out, which would, uh, with originally, it would have been sheep's wool. But obviously we don't use sheep's wool today. We just use um, a piece of wadding or something like that. Right. So did they, do they do the embellishment on the fabric first? Like if you were going to do a little stitching on it, did you do that first before you put it in the, made the ring? Put it on the ring? Um, again, um, it's one of those things that uh, we don't know for sure. But when I teach people how to make the singleton button, I always say do it after because you've got a nice padded area that you can actually sew in. Um, but if you think the women who used to make those singleton buttons originally, they would have had to have made, and this goes for all buttons, um, they would have had to make about 144 buttons a, a week. Oh my! And when you've got to make that many, Holy you're smokes. not going to be too hurt. You too too worried about uh, how fine your embroidery is on the top of that um, button. That's why they kept it to a very simple, a, in fact, an incredibly simple design, like a little daisy or, or little French knots. And so then, the 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 fabric isn't around it it's more like it's encased in the the ring is encased in the in yes. the fabric yes yes and it used to be encased in the fabric by using a little bit of runnings a few running stitches uh, on the inside of the ring occasionally it was um using a uh, they would have actually used a blanket stitch around the ring to keep it firm but the the majority of the buttons that i've seen have um a little bit of, uh, well, like actually, effectively, it's a backstitch around the inside of the ring, just to keep everything in place. 144 buttons a week. Ima imagine the ergonomics, the you know, repetitive stress. Yeah. Right. Oh, right. man. But you are talking a long time ago, and those women would not have had such, known of such conditions. Right. And much sturdier people than we are today by, by far. Yeah. <laughs> wow. mm -hmm. uh, so, all right. So we start with a cartwheel button. And uh, what, what is of the, of the basic four, what is the most difficult? The high top? High top. The high top and the dorset knobs are the most difficult. Okay. Because they, they also are take the longest as well. I got to try these. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, every time we talk to somebody, it's one more thing. Who was it? Anna Crutchley we talked to about making braids and... And, and cords. And cords. Oh, and, gosh, you must get into that. That's lovely. Oh, and her work <laughs> is so gorgeous. And, and then this comes along. It's like, oh, I got to do this too. Right. Well, the thing is, what you can do is combine the two, which is what I've done. Oh, okay. Now explain this. Have <laughs> um, <the two. laughs> I, I mentioned that I do the wall art. Um, sometimes what I do is I use a variety of um, buttons and other forms of craft or skills or what have you, and also fabrics. And I, they're not exactly um, an applique. But it's rather like creating a design using fabrics and buttons and other forms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's just and one of the pieces of wall art that I did included uh, braid, mm -hmm. which I had to do myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the thing looking at your, uh, at your work. The, the way you work the buttons into those pieces with the other pieces of fabric and it really is just fascinating art that that goes it goes way beyond just a simple button it I really really enjoyed that yeah thanks uh, that's just i love doing that see gary now we need you have another thing now you know she has those wooden forms so you, you get you get you could have just order one of her wooden forms so that way you have the wooden piece sitting on your desk and it'll look lovely with the little things to make the uh the high tops right that Right. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, yes, those, those, those wooden molds. Yes, yeah. I, I had to get those specially made by um, someone I know. And uh, and uh, he, 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 I must admit, he does do a very good job for me. Okay. So there you go. Just another piece of 
wooden art at your house. Oh, I'm a su- <laughs> and I'm a sucker for good woodwork. Yep, any day of the week, <laughs> sign me up. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, Anna, are you um, are you one of those? Are you you always have a button in your hand, uh, like a knitter's always knitting, um, or do you leave it on the table and walk away at some point? Sometimes I have to leave it on the table and walk away because you do need thinking time. Mm-hmm. And if you're constantly making it, uh, it, it, it's, I prefer to think about what basically the next project, try to get more of the creative head rather than a, than a, just a, let's churn out as many buttons as I can head. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. Right. What what threads uh, do you find yourself using uh, most today? Are you uh, cotton, wool, silk? At the moment, I'm just churning out things for Christmas. Um, but uh, I've just put, managed to get my hands on some wonderful uh, vintage DMC silk threads, and uh, which I must admit are just so lovely to work with. Mm. But uh, I can see myself getting involved and making small little earrings and things like that using beautiful threads. One of my favorite companies for threads and yarns, etc., over here in England, is a company called Yarn Yarn. And they import threads from a, a ladies' cooperative in North India. And it's hand. Well, uh, hand spun nettle yarn or hand spun silk yarn or hand spun everything's handmade and it, the quality is I must admit lovely and it's it's because it's handmade you get that wonderful texture where nothing is quite shall we say it, it's not constant you always get the little glitch now and again which I love mm-hmm. yeah I have a ball I, I have a ball of sorry silk that's been I think it's been spun somehow and it's lovely stuff and and I do every now and then I'll use a little bit of it you know because it's it's a mixture of colors and I think it was someone was you're supposed to knit with it but I I don't knit so I I look at that and I think oh what can I do with it now you've got me thinking yeah I I could make a a hoop you could make not only that, the other thing you can actually do with the um, the sari silks, because I used to make a range of um, sort of corsage type buttons, you know, um, brooches, where you use the sari silk ribbons, basically they call it over here, um, in its natural frayed state, cut it out into about 10 centimeter lengths, um, fold over, and then join them all together with um, running stitches. So they hang from the thread mainly, then pull them together and that's a a sort of petal flower shape. And then a a lovely design button in the center. And you can, because of the colors, you can really go to town with colors on your button. Right, right. This is more like a yarn, like they somehow put something Uh, that's spun it. Yes, I know the. Uh, yes, I think I know the one you mean. It does it. Um, is it quite flexible? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Very yeah. soft. Very soft. And I and I and I haven't wanted to use it a lot because it's just such a lovely mm-hmm. fiber, and and I wouldn't necessarily stick it in a needle and stitch on needlework with it, but maybe weaving a, a um, doing yeah. something with a hoop and making a. Because it's too large for a smaller button, yeah. But a larger yeah. hoop, um, it might just be lovely. I, yes, yes. I think I know the yarn you mean. And if it is, yes, it does come out. It has a wonderful, wonderful. It almost has a sheen to it. Mm-hmm. 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 And this has got a lot of. It's got a lot of dark greens in it, so I think it would make a lovely mm-hmm. background almost. And then mm-hmm. weave a little bit. Anyway, now you got me thinking. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> and off she goes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dear. No supper tonight. I've I've got to yes. work on a project. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> okay, so uh, so talk about your book. Now, there's a book that we can get. Uh, 
what what do we get out of that? Is that uh, show all the techniques? Yes, I've got a little instruction booklet which um, tells you all the, the techniques on how to make all four types of dorset button. And also it goes on to variations within the thread button, which is the, um, the, 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 the uh, one where the thread is wound around the ring. Um, variations on uh, how, what you can do with that particular design. It also has a template for um, the high top button and also for, um, I think it's got a template for the bird's eye as well. Mm -hmm. So that so that's a good resource to start with. Uh, and I assume if we take one of your workshops, uh, good to have that in hand then. Oh, you don't have to because I do give um, people all the... Um, no, Anna, sell books. books. Anna, sell books. Oh, yes. So, yes, yes, you must have this yes. book along with my workshop as a supplement. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> marketing. Marketing is important. <laughs> I'm the worst at that myself. <laughs> sell it. Sell it. Yeah. <laughs> So okay, but that's that's great. So then, and then going through your Etsy shop, I can get all the parts I need. Uh, it looked like just about everything I could need if I want to make these buttons. Um, that you you have that to offer, so that uh, you make for a, a good source for uh, exactly what you would need to do buttons. Absolutely yes, that's what I try to design all my kits, so that uh, if anybody wanted to have a go. Uh, they've got everything there in my in my kits. Yeah. The only thing I don't supply are scissors. I'm afraid you do have to supply your own scissors. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. That's a huge problem. Let's see. One, <laughs> two, three, four, five. No, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Yep. All right. One last question. In a normal work day. What portion is making buttons and what portion is getting up and getting one of the hula hoops and and twisting it around? <laughs> <laughs> well, getting up and twisting, uh, should we say, uh, trying to use my hula hoops, how it should be used, zero. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, working on buttons probably the whole of the afternoons. <laughs> okay. All right. Because, see, I'm envisioning you standing there with the hoop spinning around your hips and then your hands making a button. See, this is this is the ultimate. Yeah. Oh, I wish I wish. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, uh, I think my, my, my studio at the moment is so untidy that I think if I tried that, everything would be locked everywhere. <laughs> uh, that's yeah, just a vision yeah. I had there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when, when's the next workshop? We got a schedule coming up here. Uh, yes. The next workshop. Um, oh gosh. Let me just see. Next workshop is on the 29th that I'm doing online. Mm -hmm. And um, then after that, um, I've got another one, which is, um, um, full, but um, then after that, let me just virtual, here we go. Yes, the one after that, I think is on something like the 5th. 5th of December? And, yeah. And that's, there's room for that. So people, so people can get, uh, you have a regular schedule that people can sign up for then. Oh, yes. Yes. I, on my, on my uh, homepage of my website, um, you can sign up. I, do, I, may, I produce a Dorset Button e-newsletter um, three times a year. And that goes out to about 1,400 people around the world. And also, I've got, if you sign up to that, you also have an option of two other things you can sign up for. One, a list of my workshops, which they'll get as and when I organize them, and also um, exhibitions that I'm involved in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they okay. sign up for that all on your on your page, which is Henry's Buttons, correct? Yes, yes. On Henry's 
um, and henrys.buttons.co.uk. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to get I, I got to get the newsletter now. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> got to get the newsletter. Got to get the book because you need the book to take the class. I mean, we, we've established that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah, and I definitely need the book because I need to figure out how to make those singletons. Oh, that was I, to give you exactly how to work those, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I've made a few Dorset buttons and they are they are great fun. I The first time I took a class with them um, was on a needlepoint piece. She taught us how to make a, a simple Dorset button. And mm -hmm. then, and I thought, oh, I don't think I'll ever do this again. It's, you know, too much winding of thread. And then I kept seeing them various places and I've tried them now another couple of times. And I keep thinking of, I just want to play with them some more because there's something about that shape and doing that, you know, doing the stitching in the button that makes it so fascinating um, and using all the threads I have, because I have quite, I do have quite a stash as Gary has insinuated. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you, you hit on it, Beth. That's what I think at the next level intrigues me is the way these buttons can become an embellishment for mm -hmm. all kinds of needlework. I mean, you take just even a, a, a simple sampler and to make some buttons and to drop those in here and there in the sampler, um, uh, county canvas needlepoint, And there's just is, is all kinds of places where uh, these buttons could be a real really attractive embellishment right yes Absolutely. they certainly can they really can mm -hmm. right and then and then you have on your because i went and poked around your etsy shop shop um you have them as as brooches too um i, I wouldn't wear dang i don't really like dangly earrings they kind of bother me but i thought oh that's just just lovely to have a little uh, a dorset button in a very fine thread that's, you know, as a brooch or a pin or a, a pendant. Um, just those were lovely. So, yeah, it just expands that too, you know, um, what they can be used for. You know, just need to yes. use them to do clothing. Mm -hmm. But I keep thinking all those people who do knit would want to know how to make a dorsal button. You spend all that time knitting a cardigan or knitting something. Who wants a plain old button that you get from the big box store when you yeah. can make your own oh absolutely absolutely and also uh people who knit the um you know when you do very very well both you say you don't knit but um, people who do have the, when you knit something in very very fine um lace yarn um if you make something that needs a button to put on the front you don't want a heavy button you just want something really, really light. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult to buy a man-made one. And if you use the bird's eye button from the Dorset button range, they are made from the same, they can be made from the same yarn. Also, they're just so light. They just don't pull that front down if it's a sort of cardigan or something like that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, well, that's right, right. So there's so many uses. I just, you know, I can see why people are 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 becoming more intrigued with them again. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. This has been fun. We got to wrap up, but I do have one more question. Have you ever made them with uh, sheep horn? Have you, Have you actually used the sheep horn to make them? No, I haven't. No. I've got a collection of sheep's horn, and um, I've seen the discs that you can make the. Um, uh, the high tops from in museums, but I haven't actually used it myself. Um, I'd be a bit reluctant to do that, I think. I wouldn't quite know, you know, sort of handling the something like that. But uh, no, if it came my way, I'd probably give it a go. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just, just a curiosity thing, because it, it would be very different from a stainless steel uh, ring, yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And and so uh, do you continue to collect them? Are you, I mean, are you always on the lookout for buttons to add to your collection? I am, yes. Um, in fact, I'm uh, 
I've just managed to get a whole load of um, singletons on a racial black card, which meant, uh, denotes that they were the second best, which I'm really pleased about. But wow. buttons are now very, very collectible. So I don't know how long I'll be able to carry on doing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now see, quit, quit adding new information because then I have questions. So a black card was second level. How did they grade them? Uh, the pink card was um, depicted at uh, the top, the best buttons. Black was second best, and yellow card was thirds. I love the yeah, history. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it would be fun to to go to the museums now, and we're gonna have to start looking and seeing what we can find. And so, if we have any listeners that you know, especially are you know in Washington D.C. at the, the, I wonder if the Smithsonian has some um, um, there. Mm -hmm. yeah that would be interesting to find out yep because then we'd have to do a road trip <laughs> oh darn oh darn we would have to do a lot of things <laughs> look at the original clothing yes <laughs> right yeah. right right <laughs> yeah oh uh, well all right anna this is this has opened up a whole new world for me I, this is um this is fun yeah this is great <laughs> stuff okay so it's uh it's henry's buttons dot you was it henrys.buttons.co.uk is the website? Henrysbuttons.co.uk. Okay. Henry's, mm -hmm. and we'll have a link in, in all the materials, but Henry's Button, and that's where you start. And then that's you can go to the Etsy shop there, and she has a Facebook page, and um, you can learn about Dorset Buttons and take her classes. And, yeah. oh, boy, oh, boy. Mm -hmm. More mm -hmm. enabling going on here. Mm -hmm. All the time. All the time. Yeah. Oh, I've got to mention that, that I'm also a good doing a class for the um, the Lace Museum, which is um, let me just get the website up for you, the LaceMuseum.org, which is uh, based in San Francisco. And you're doing a class for them too, a virtual class. A virtual class um, on the first of December. No, oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is so cool because the, the, they're coming right up here. We can we can actually uh, um, get involved early. Yeah, excellent, excellent. <laughs> All right, Anna, boy, this was fun. Thanks for doing this. We appreciate it. Well, thank you both. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. Yep. And Thanks. if I can help with buttons in any way, let me know. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks to everyone for listening. Mm -hmm.